Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Perez Art Museum, Miami. My name is Marie Vickles, and I'm the Director of Education. And tonight, we are presenting the online version of our Local Views at PAM program with artist Alexander Zastera. Our virtual Local Views program is presented with the generous support of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation and features Miami-based artists sharing their practice and discussing works of art from PAM's exhibition programs that connect in various ways to their own work. As a 21st century museum dedicated to representing the people and communities of South Florida, the Perez Art Museum Miami strives to be a leader in the presentation, study, interpretation, and care of international modern and contemporary art while representing and cherishing the unique diversity of Miami-Dade. Through our exhibitions and programs, we aim to encourage everyone to see art as an incentive for genuine human interaction. Tonight, I'm so happy to present our very own Alexander Zastera, a Miami-based artist whose sublimely mystical works ask us to explore the world around us while also reflecting upon ourselves. Before I introduce Alexander, I would like to acknowledge and thank the incredible team of people that work so very hard to make these programs come together online. <clears throat> thank you to Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult Programs and Audience Engagement, and our world-class AV team, Denise Faxis and Andrew Bird. We couldn't do this without you, thank you. Let's get started. Alexander Zestera is known for their dark mystical paintings, found object installation and public performance centered around the environment. Alexander graduated with a BFA in studio art. Need a little sip here. <clears throat> and a BA in art history from Florida State University. Based in Miami Beach, <clears throat> Florida, and working as an artist, activist, and educator, they use their studio work and interest in public education to address local ecological issues. Currently, Alexander gallivants in a guise of the masked superhero, Climate Crusader, a South Florida-based environmental superhero, building <clears throat> climate resilience and awareness through videos, public performance, thus inspiring community action to save the planet. Alexander has and continues to play an integral role in PAM's educational programs at the museum, working with audiences of all ages, sharing genuine art experiences with our community. As you watch along this evening on Facebook or YouTube Live, please post questions for Alexander in the comments section. They will try to answer as many as possible in the Q&A portion of this evening's presentation. And remember, if you value this and other programs presented by the museum, please consider supporting us by going to pam.org backslash donate. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Alexander Zastera. Hi, thank you so much, Marie, Anita, Denise, um, Andrew, really appreciate uh, your support in this. Hi, my name is Alexander Zastera. I'm a community educator, artist, activist, uh, climate crusader here in Miami Beach. And um, today I wanted to spend some time going through um, the large facets of my practice, but then relate that to my time spent in the museum. As Marie mentioned, um, I spent um, and still do um, several things in terms of the educations, not just for the PAM, but for a lot of South Florida institutions and that has really influenced the types of work that I go into. So without further ado, let's go ahead and go into the slides a little bit. Okay, so let's go into here. Um, so my background, um, my background has definitely been extremely influential in, in my work. Um, so I got a BFA in studio art and BA in art history from Florida State University, and I use that all the time. I focused on the art of the Americas as well as, um, at the time, I'm um, really focused on a studio practice in painting, um, but we'll see how that has actually evolved as I go through my work. I've spent 
the last six years um, in different institutions, PAM, Bass, Wilsonian, Biscayne Nature Center, ICA, and other nature or, and uh, other nature and education centers. And that has really influenced not just my work, but also my thought process. So PAM has been such a huge chunk of my life and has been so influential. We in the education department, um, it is the second largest arts education um, in the city of Miami besides the public schools. So children would come to the museum um, thousands and thousands every year and have free tours where they go around and sit and use inquiry method, which is a open ended questioning method to talk and learn about the work um, and explore the museum. So I was a teaching artist and here you have two teaching artists, Ashley and Lori, um, and you see them sitting and um, facilitating the conversation with the groups and we would just go in and work on observation skills, um, connecting larger questions and themes and really diving into how to break down these large kind of conceptual matters um, and talk about them, but talk about them through what their lenses, the, uh, the lens of whoever was coming to visit the museum. So all the way from pre-K all the way to college um, uh, would go and dive into these things. So that really influenced because I got to see the wide variety of all the students from Miami, from all over Miami-Dade, um, even some coming visiting from other counties and walking through the mu museum and learning from their perspective. So it was a nice way to have a pinpoint to touch on all aspects of the community. Um, and right now, another thing that's really influencing my work, which we'll get into, is I also just started a master's in environmental studies um, from FIU. So uh, when I was particularly in the museum, one of the focuses that I would try to spin and talk about would be um, relationship to environment and not just like the physical space of the museum, but our, our outside environment and how we relate to the city and its spaces. So some of the things that I want you kind of thinking about as I go through my talk and, and talk about my work is these are some of the larger things that I think about when I'm making my work, or at least that have actually some come out of um, making the work. So first at the top, I have complex historical storytelling. So a lot of my work will touch base on um, events, um, socio-ideological structures, um, and how kind of all those things kind of play and spin together. Um, multidisciplinary, I, while well, I've been trained as a painter, I also am a classically trained flautist. Um, so I mix in um, music and um, performance, acting, um, different kinds of things uh, um, into the works. So they're very, very multidimensional. Um, energy work. So we'll get a little bit more into that in terms of the, the work that I do with the energy sector, but also the physicality of imbuing some of these works um, with physical um, energies or vibrations. Science. So again, going into the science masters, I like to rope in um, these different sorts of STEAM elements. And for those of you who are not familiar, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, mysticism, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Environment. Again, what is around us and how are we experiencing things? Public education, so how are these things being digested? What is the pedagogical structures? How are people um, absorbing the information from the works? And then real world problem solving. So identifying real problems within the community, um, within um, kind of thought processes and trying to um, make an active move forward to create action towards those things. So starting with the, my foundational work and what I mean by foundational work is the work that I started making when I came to Miami. I have always been interested in what is around me and kind of how to digest that. So when I first moved to Miami, the works that are on the middle and the right hand side, my nightscapes, I started a whole series of doing these plain air studies of capturing um, different scenes. These are specifically from Little Haiti, Wynwood, Edgewater. And when I was capturing these scenes, um, it is still happening, but the, the gentrification that was happening in the area, the rapid trans, um, transforming of these spaces, I was trying to capture them before they go. So for instance, the one that is the um, piece that is on the bottom, uh, right hand side with the gate open, that building does not exist anymore. That was a building that me and my musician friends um, 
would hang out at and it has been torn down and a high rise has been made. But some of the other things that I was thinking about a lot with that particular um, work and series is aspects of light and how that can tell a story. So um, playing with incandescent light, iridescent light, um, and you can really tell the social fabric of a place by looking at the light tones. So for instance, as you're going through the design district, they have all like these blue bulbs, or if you're going to different neighborhoods, you might see like the, the white um, iridescent and then the incandes um, incandescent. Like, so there's so there's way that you can tell the strata, uh, the social strata of a city just by looking at the lights. So I was very interested in that, as well as light pollution and where our energy comes from. And you'll see later in my work that that, that ended up being a carry through, which I, didn't think necessarily, um, but it was very interesting how those are now re-relating um, to the work and the stuff that I'm doing now. And on the left-hand side is um, my piece Oracle from 2017. So this work was made um, during the 2017 hurricane season. And I, not that you need a reminder, but it was a very, very active hurricane season. That was the hurricane season that we did have Irma come and um, skirt by and kind of hit Miami a little bit. But this work was made throughout the season using collected items of denim. So I was taking in all of this um, found um, and donated denim and I was bleaching it and letting it sit outside and collect um, rainwater and um, see how it transformed. And when Hurricane Irma ended up passing by, I had all this denim tied around fence posts. So it was like hurricane charged. And I did a sound work where I recorded the pieces. So again, going into kind of the historical complex storytelling is the, it's an actual account of Irma, it's the physical recordings, the, the energy of the storm, and then the found objects that are placed within, which you see a little bit with maybe like the wand on the um, top right hand side. Um, the, the objects that were placed in the storm talked about like the sociopolitical things that were happening at the time. So um, it was focusing on um, immigration, um, LGBTQ rights, um, environment, and foreign meddling. So spinning around into this uh, political storm, if you will. So again, environment, very important to me. Uh, and uh, some of the things that I am learning about and trying to communicate are some very like large scale difficult problems that we're going to be seeing. And I'll go a little bit more into that into the next slide. But in terms of trying to get people on board with um, learning very complicated concepts about the very web-like integrated um, systems of the world, uh, it's very difficult to sometimes get those points across or there isn't necessarily the um, complete public infrastructure built out for people to understand those things. And the problem is that those things then roll over into aspects like policy. So when people are making decisions, if they are not fully aware of the science behind it, then you're making policy decisions that um, have future implications um, for things like hurricanes or sea level rise, especially here in Miami being um, one of the cities that will be hit hardest by climate change. So. I developed this um, superhero, Climate Crusader. And Climate Crusader is this kind of goofy, sort of um, optimistic character that goes around and teaches climate education. So I've worked with a couple different um, organizations and artist residencies um, teaching about um, Florida, but also thinking um, more globally about these interconnected systems and how um, my melting ice caps are going to affect us in Miami and us having to think about how we're going to have to transform our energy systems. So this is something that I've been working on. And again, tying it back to my time at PAM's education um, uh, and education department, some of the things that I really learned is when we were when we develop inquiry, we develop these series of questions. We think about vocab, how it's connecting to Florida State standards. So um, in the bottom right, you actually see the workshop art in action. So I've I, I was thinking about like my time spent there on making all of these. Um, uh, inquiry method sheets that we have to go through and study. I was thinking about that process and the the foundation um, of 
uh, the structure there when I'm making these sort of things, as well as like, how are things that delivered? What do people um, engage with? How can art be a tool for catalyst for change, um, especially socially? So that gets into my larger work. So like Climate Crusader is not just me putting on a suit and talking to children. It's also doing the um, infrastructure and civic um, policy legwork here in Miami. So first I wanna point out up in the top right-hand corner that the last seven years have been the hottest years on record. And we're starting to only see the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the things that are going to be coming down the pipeline. And I think that a lot of people saw this summer when we had the um, giant fish kill in the Bay where the, uh, the when water heats up, there is less dissolved oxygen in the water and it can hold less oxygen. So basically we had these massive amounts of fish die off because the water was too hot. There wasn't enough oxygen for the fish to breathe. So they basically starved to death. Um, and the thing is, we're going to be seeing this more and more. And there's other factors like um, algae that is also absorbing um, some of the oxygen and causing these die offs. And that is caused by the fertilizers that are coming off of um, yard um, yards and lawns um, and just like public works. But there are all these interconnected things. And the thing is that like it's only getting hotter. So I'm trying to help communicate and work to um, mediate some of these issues that we're going to be seeing down the line. So some of the things that I've been involved in are the um, Miami Climate Alliance. I am their communications co-chair. So I work very closely with them. They are an organization that has over 70 different climate organizations and they act as the central hub um, for helping to coordinate those organizations into a more powerful punch when it comes to um, getting civic action. And some of the things that we were focused on specifically this last summer, um, 2020, was Florida Power and Light was trying to shut off people who had not paid their bills. And we were actually instrumental in pushing back that um, deadline three times um, through um, um, different forms of communication and um, civic action to get them to be like, hi, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You still have some money. It's okay. People need power right now. Um, it's become a basic right. So that's some of the like active things that we're doing in the community to try to um, move. The big goal is to move um, us to a democratized 100% um, renewable energy system. So. Some of the other organizations that I work with or have worked with is Catalyst Miami. Shout out to Catalyst. Um, they are an amazing organization that was actually founded by the current mayor, um, Danielle Levine Cava. And they have a whole bunch of programs, but the ones that I want to give a specific shout out to are CLEAR, which is Community Leadership on Environment Advocacy and Resiliency. And that's the program that I took and they gave me a micro grant to start um, Climate Crusader. And they're actually looking for a new cohort um, that starts on February 17th. Um, so you can sign up for it, um, catalystmiami.org, I believe. And they also have a another course, which is HEAL, um, which focuses on um, housing advocacy. So those programs, they're free. They normally would provide you with lunch and I or dinner, and they're once a week. And so right now they're online. And what I will say is for those programs, literally, all the people that I met in that class in the 11 week program that I took, I'm still in contact with them. I'm still doing projects with them. I see them all around. So those were things that like, it was a really effective in terms of the community building um, and really making a web of advocacy. Um, and then the Climate Reality Project is a project by um, Al Gore. And I recently did a training with them and they are also trying to kind of build up um, climate literacy on a global scale by training people to talk about climate. Inner world. So that's like my larger like community work and what I'm doing outside um, and, and trying to build kind of the public literacy behind climate. But I also, like I said, I, I, I was trained as a painter and I definitely use paintings as a tool to talk about kind of like what's happening internally. Um, but also um, going back to the aspects of mysticism there, I, I get a lot of communications with like dreams and stuff. And a lot of things will kind of like permeate before they end up like permeating into like our 3D reality. So I'll get 
you know, dreams about a hurricane coming and then build up this hurricane and a hurricane comes. Um, and this particular piece on the right hand side um, called Portrait of the World, this was my, um, my vision for, um, I, I made this the second half of 2019. So starting in July um, until December, and as you can see, the world is burning. So thinking about like the Australian fires and then um, I have the bat Corona. So I'm um, thinking a lot about like, where did COVID come from? These bats and zoonautical diseases. Um, so they're kind of like these uh, sort of larger warning slash recording of what's happening through time and space. And um, my internal feelings about what is going on. So, and you and this one you see, I was, crying and upset because, you know, it's, it was, a, it was going into a heavy year. Um, but also having the purple star up there, which is kind of what I represent as like the star of hope. And then on the left hand side, I had this piece Jupiter, which was from a show that I did up in uh, Jersey City, shout out to Deep Space. Um, they, I did a show with them where I built a sound portal. So I built this like large vibrating structure that um, took the um, sonic identities, the vibrational status of each of the planets in the solar system, and then it vibrated into this bench water tire thing that you could see the different um, uh, patterns that the vibration of the water would make, but then you would also be able to feel the vibration of each of the planets. So it was a kind of exploration of um, our solar system and my interest in like stars and space um, and energy fields. Um, and that also kind of comes into my larger work. Um, so again, kind of wrapping with the energy work that I was talking about before. So I'm doing energy work in terms of public policy, but then also these paintings, this particular painting you can see in the middle um, that it's life-size. On my paintings, I usually will sometimes meditate into them. So I'll, I'll physically lay and meditate for a couple hours and kind of put my energy stamp onto them before I, I, I go on to the next piece. Um, yeah, so they're just an exploration of, of, of me, but trying to talk and communicate in a way that um, I feel most comfortable. So that, that gets me to um, this work. COVID-19 fever dream, the illegal download of your soul. Um, and from earlier, you could actually see it behind me. I don't know if I have a little thing up right now, but um, I wanted to also show you in terms of scale, since when people see this work, they're quite surprised by the size. Um, so I have that person right there that's kind of showing the scale. So this, this painting was painted in 2020 and it was throughout, I started it in February and then finished it in October. And basically it was, it was 2020. It was everything that 2020 was um, just, you know, uh, trying to organize chaos and um, look at how some of these like larger societal structures are um, operating together. So um, going through the painting, I have the bats up top with the, with a hand offering blood. And then you kind of come down into um, this, this gate with the barbed wire that's talking about the ice attainment centers. Um, moving down to the bottom corner, you have these um, red and blue crabs that are fighting each other and talking about like crabby politics and they're all holding like different little signs. Um, the Biscayne Bay fish kill off that I was talking about. So I have all these dead fish that are at my feet and I'm standing in the middle with these bat wings and my head cut off screaming at the world. Um, shed your egos and spill your truth. Um, we have um, uh, some mermaids, we have uh, alien UFO saucer, we have the 2020 graduation balloons, the Miami Beach Convention Center being turned into a hospital, shark fins spilling out. Um, but at the end of the day, also Climate Crusader up there with a portal to hope, um, because this was definitely a really hard, um, it was it was the hardest piece I've ever had to make. Um, it was really difficult. I'm very, I'm very porous as a person and I feel a lot and um, I was kind of feeling the collective angst and energy. And so this was my way of expelling that into um, something that can help capture it. Um, and as you can see, there's um, all the water is actually written text, like a hand diary the entire way down. And then it also has black light layers, which you see on the left hand side. So there is a whole black light understructure that has like hidden layers with text. Um, 
that permeates the piece as well as I was talking earlier about like the the energy and vibration that I also vibrational work that I also do. So this piece, um, it's a lot about shadow work and shadow work is about really looking at different aspects of yourself and some of the uncomfortable things that you don't want to necessarily address. Um, and I did in this work, as you can see at the bottom, um, Pam is on the horizon line. And uh, this was a really hard time for all of us, for all of us, and especially the cultural sector. And I wanted to talk about this specifically because it's not just about Pam. This is the, the arts in general here in Miami took, well, everywhere took a massive, massive hit in terms of um, uh, uh, funding, but also um, the the infrastructure and people. And it was just a, a really hard time. And I don't think that we've yet had the time to like really kind of publicly just discuss and like mourn that a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's hard, but also like these institutions kind of need to look at and reevaluate rather than running away from some of these hard conversations, they need to actually like look at their physical structures more deeply and figure out ways to change that. And I will by all means say that like institutions are big wheels. And so it takes a long time for them to change, but we need to as a community hold them accountable and make sure that they're also doing the work to do that. So um, in terms of building back community trust, um, Pam, like I would say it is wonderful and I'm so grateful to be here in this space at Local Views. Um, and I think through this time we've really, we found that like we can't necessarily rely on the international community that like when things go down, it comes back to home. And as us locals being, and I know that you have some Miami artists in collections, but like we don't have dedicated space in the museum. You know, what would it mean if you walk into OV1 or OV2 and it's dedicated to just Miami artists so that you're introducing the world to Miami before you take it up into an international context? Like if you want our full support, have a space for us. Be proud of us. There are amazing people. We we're talking about like the civic engagement and the arts. Like there are so many amazing artists in this city and they're doing the work. So like, let's show them off. Um, and then just like, just larger, and this is not just at PAM, but like the arts community here in Miami, like we really need to look at our funding structures. And it's not just the, what's being funneled from the top down in terms of the museum. And even that I have a problematic with saying top down, but like, it also needs to be like, how are we operating and getting these money and getting support? Like what, what happens? Like if you're trying to bring in marginalized communities into the museum, what does it mean if the money that you have going into the museum was made by physically displacing those people farther away from the museum? So it's like, we have to think about these like larger wheels that are turning within the city and it can't just be the internal the internal structure. It also needs to be of us really thinking about what are different modes and models? Like, why do we have to continue to use these same models that we have? Like, I think the thing that we've really learned from 2020 and really seeing what's going on is like, you know, we can bring anything into reality, but we need to not already kind of put our blinders on or just say like, this is the way it's been. So this is how it's going to be. We need to like open up and look and see what are different models? How can cryptocurrency be involved? Like um, the digital museum, what does our outreach look like there? How can we monetize that? How can we um, really build that trust and support and do it healthy and safely? And then when it comes to the funding, like it's not to necessarily push these people out, but like invite them in, but also like know that I think it's our job to have the conversations to get them to understand how what they might be doing in the city is affecting others. That's on us. If we're sitting there, it's like a friend, you know, if you sit there and see like problematic behavior, we need to like call it out and say what it is, or at least just be like, hi, like I'm your friend, but as a friend, I'm going to say this. So anyways, yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that. I think we need some healing there. 
like not necessarily comment below. I would like, we're about to go into questions and I would say like, let's not necessarily ask questions about this. I just needed to say it. Um, ask more about my practice, please. But yes, moving on. How can you support me? Um, so alexandrasastera.com, I have a whole bunch of paintings up there. Please buy. Um, but also um, I have um, at Zastera, you can follow my, um, my Instagram and at climate.crusader. And there's also climatecrusader.com. And I think there is, yeah, there definitely is a button to donate. I'm not saying I think there is. Um, but yeah, just like support my work. I'm doing a lot. And when you're purchasing a painting, it's not just the painting, like you're helping me to dive into these methods. You're helping to pay for grad school. Um, so yeah, just um, if you like what I do, talk to me, okay? Um, and I think Anita, I'm ready for questions. Hi, thank you so much. I don't know how any questions can follow that, but here <laughs> goes. Um, the first question we have is from Danielle Steele and she asks, Alex, do you find that your environmental activism and spiritual practice overlap? If so, what does that look like? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, um, yes, absolutely. Um, I would say um, I'm very in tune with Earth. So currently, like what I'm doing with Climate Crusader, I really can't reveal the, the level of metrics of like what I'm going into. I just showed you guys like the tip of the iceberg, but there's some things, some visions that I'm getting that are um, making me uncomfortable. And so I'm trying, uh, some of the things that Climate Crusader is doing is like working up to try to shift what I've been seeing and make um, a more healthy and successful future. Love it, love it, thank you. Um, okay, Angela Bolaños Osorio asks, uh, where do you see Miami's growth in terms of understanding the importance of environmental sustainability and how can we encourage our fellow Miamians to keep the environment at the forefront of our day-to-day -day lives? Mm. Great question, Angela. Thank you. Um, you know, it's nice. I have actually seen it shift. Um, I will say the, like the unfortunate double-edged sword to that is, um, in the shift, it, it's been a lot, at least from people that haven't like had it on the forefront of their mind, like the Biscayne Bay fish kill, like people were talking about it. Like I was, you know, I'd go out and somebody I would see, they'd be like, yo, did you see that? And like somebody who had never like, not that they weren't having these discussions among friends, but sometimes you need sort of these um, more jarring situations to bring people into full reality of like what's happening. But I will say um, like being a part of the Miami Climate Alliance and seeing all the different organizations and meeting so many people like, it, it is happening and you know it can even happen just on a smaller scale of you wanting to go and sit in a park and enjoy the green spaces. Um, but I will say like in terms of that, like we also need all of us advocating, like, like, like we can't just like hold it for granted if we don't hold these spaces. Like for example, um, Nikki Free just sent out an email and there has been a lot of um, the um, Miccosukee and Seminole pushing against this, but the EPA was trying to shift um, the control of wetlands to Florida. And Florida has a long record of basically putting development over natural resources. And that's a big problem because as we're starting to see more flooding, as we're starting to see um, issues with like our groundwater, we need those areas to be able to filter and hold. So um, the, she just recently sent an email and it looks like they're going to be shifting it back to the um, EPA, the control of the wetlands. Um, but that's just a, a current example of like, you know, how activism can help to shift some of these things. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Austin San Juan. How do you practice sustainability in your painting? Uh, what tips do you have for, for visual artists to be eco-friendly in their practice? Nice. Thank you, Austin. Um, I would say, well, I use, I, I hoard, like in terms of like, I still have all my paints and stuff from college, so I'm still painting with them. Um, I also try to think about like, you know, um, uh, filtering my paint water before it goes down the drain to make sure I'm trying to like catch stuff. I'm also not using oil paint. Um, I'm using uh, either acrylic or, or watercolor, some wa water soluble stuff. But a lot of, I would say beyond my paintings, um, I've done a lot of like the, the hurricane or um, some collage assemblage stuff, which I didn't show. I was collecting like 
my recycling containers. Oh, I paint out of my recycling containers. If you're a painter, paint out of recycling containers. But um, uh, yeah, collecting those objects like jeans and stuff, as much as that we can refine and recycle, um, I think that that's really important, but also like looking at the toxicity levels and where where is that water going? What are you doing with that? Um, always having those on your mind when you're doing that kind of stuff. Great, thank you. Okay, a question from Joan Braun. Can you talk a little or a lot more about fortune telling and your process? Joan! <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, okay. it's a little bit of like, I would say, like person to person, like I do a lot of like tarot readings and that sort of stuff. Um, but in terms of like the fortune telling aspect of um, the, the work, the vision stuff that I don't really have control over necessarily. Um, and dreams are like different than visions, like um, usually like with the hurricane, it came in like I was having the same exact vision for like a week and a half, a week and a half, like every single time, like in the middle of this hurricane, it like, and I always saw it like skirting, kind of hitting Miami, but never like, um, but I also like, you know, it, it's hard because it's not something, it, sometimes it also like with the bats, it speaks like a metaphor. So like, I don't know necessarily what's specifically coming. I'm just kind of like queuing into this larger thing that's kind of like keeps telling me that I need to like touch upon these points. And then it's like the hindsight is 2020, whatever ends up um, kind of playing out that I'm like, oh, that's where that come in. Um, which is also kind of nice because like after the paintings happen, then they still unfold. Right. Right, there's always more layers that you're taking through or that are appearing to you even. Awesome. Okay, yeah. one last question from Sandra L. Portel Andreu. What are your hopes for grad school and how do you think this will further inform and shape your work? Hi, Sandra. Um, well, I just got done talking to my grad school advisor and I will see, I'm, I'm hoping to come out of it with um, a, like a little bit more fortified of a brain in terms of understanding how these processes work. I think that that's really important. Um, B, I'm hoping to help shift their perspective because they like literally like when I'm coming in, they were like an artist, what? Like, um, so getting them to get on the steam train rather than the STEM train, um, steam, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also, um, uh, in terms of like, when I was talking about like the visionary aspect, in order to like kind of not prove, but put scientific data behind what I've been seeing. Um, I want to use the time to really do the like scientific work. So becoming a scientist and like actually going out and doing the field research that I need to do in order to um, pull the data that I need to um, and see, you know, what happens. But um, that's what I'm hoping to get out of grad school is just like a, a, a more fortified understanding and hopefully change some minds. Sounds like a rad plan. It sounds like you definitely have it all laid out. Um, we wish you the best. There are obviously, of course, we could go on forever and there's tons more questions, but we're running out of time. The comment section is lit. So I might ask you to, to go online after and address any of them that we haven't got to. But um, thank you so much, Alexander, for sharing your work and practice and life and just everything with us um, and making it so personal and fantastic. So we, we love your stuff and we appreciate you. Everybody go check out uh, Alexander's work. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Anita. Bye.